All right. Okay. Hello. Uh, today with us is uh, Professor Massimo Pigliucci. Uh, welcome, Professor Pigliucci. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. It's um, a pleasure. We will be talking about philosophy as a way of life, and also, but with an emphasis on actually modern stoicism. Um, okay, but first, before we start, I would like to say a couple of words about you uh, for the uh, audience. So, Professor Pigliucci has a PhD in evolutionary biology and a PhD in philosophy. Uh, so, both a scientist and a philosopher. He currently is the KD Iranian professor uh, of philosophy at the City College of New York. Um, his research interests include the philosophy of science, the relationship between science and philosophy, the nature of pseudoscience, and the practical philosophies of stoicism and new skepticism. At last count, Professor Pigliucci has published 181 technical papers in science and philosophy. He is also the author of author or editor of 15 books, including the best-selling How to Be a Stoic using ancient philosophy to live a modern life, which we will be focusing on today, actually. So let's then start. Um, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about what a philosophy of life is? Because when sometimes some people think that philosophy, when they hear about the word, this word philosophy, they think like a person sitting on a couch, right? Armchair, thinking about these very highly abstract, things that are irrelevant to the real life, right? They left. But now we are talking about philosophy as a way of life. So what is that? Yeah, you're right. A lot of people think that the words practical philosophy are kind of an oxymoron, you know, contradiction mm. terms. But in fact, philosophy uh, has been practical since at the very least the time of Socrates and arguably a little bit earlier. There's always been two strands to philosophy. There has been on the one hand, the kind of uh, philosophical inquiry that is abstract uh, and concerns itself with metaphysics, it concerns itself with, uh, you know, uh, thinking about the structure of the world and, and how the world works. That goes in the Western tradition that goes back to the pre-Socratics uh, of the sixth century BC. But at the same time, our philosophers have always been interested also in ethics, in politics, in, in uh, applications of philosophy to social living. Uh, particularly Socrates and, and his followers. Uh, so, so in reality, these two strands of philosophy, I think, have been there for a long time. And the same can be said for non-Western philosophies. I mean, there are uh, theoretical as well as practical strands of philosophy, let's say, in Indian philosophy or in Chinese philosophy. Uh, that said, I think that a philosophy of life, broadly speaking, and with some exceptions, is actually uh, made of three components. One is a metaphysics. That is, that's an account of how the world works. Uh, the second one is an ethics. That's an account of how we should live in the world. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is a set of practices, which are meant to help us uh, implement the ethics in, uh, in, in the world. So for instance, uh, if, think about in the case of Buddhism, let's say. Uh, well, the metaphysics includes things like uh, karma and reincarnation and you know things like that and the the um, concept of uh, not no self etc the ethics involves the four noble truths the eightfold path to enlightenment and things like that the teachings of buddha of course and then the practices include different kinds of meditation uh, there is the kind of meditation that is supposed to deflate your ego which uh Buddhists think is a major cause of suffering in the world. Uh, there is loving kindness meditation, which is supposed to help you relate better to other people and so on and so forth. So if you see it from that perspective, therefore, of these three components, metaphysics, ethics, and practice, it, it turns out that every religion is also, by definition, a philosophy of life. For instance, I grew up in Italy, in Rome, and therefore, sort of by default, I grew up Catholic. And uh, in Catholicism, you have the same thing. You have a metaphysics. That's the notion that the universe was created by a loving, all-powerful God uh, that somehow exists outside of space and time. You have ethics, obviously, in the Ten Commandments, the teachings of Jesus, you know, etc. 
And then you have practices. Uh, you read scriptures, you reflect on scriptures, you go to church, you pray, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So from that perspective, I think that both religious uh, religions, uh, religious traditions, and philosophies like Stoicism uh, or Epicureanism and so on and so forth, they're all on, in the same general boat. It's the difference between a religion and a philosophy of life is that in the case of a religion, the metaphysics includes the existence of some kind of deity. Uh, but other than that, uh, they, they seem to be very similar in structure. Hmm. So, but can we also say that in a philosophy of life, uh, rational thinking and argumentation and all that also play an essential role, but not necessarily in a religion? Of course, it can, you know, right. but not necessarily. Do you think there is also that kind of a uh, distinction too, or is it just about the metaphysics part? Uh, to some extent, I would agree, uh, but I don't think there is a sharp distinction there okay. either. There is kind of a continuum because, as you pointed out, for instance, a lot of religious traditions actually put emphasis yeah. on, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what they call apologetics. That is, you know, yeah. rational yeah. defense of their beliefs. Uh, the entire philosophy, you know, Christian philosophy during the Middle Ages was a big exercise in apologetics, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. Judaism has a large component of, you know, analyzing, you know, as rationally. Uh, their beliefs and, and so on and so forth. So there is there's that, um, yeah. and also there are some philosophies that actually are borderline mystical. Like if you think about Pythagoreanism, for instance, one of the very mm -hmm. early uh, Greek philosophies, that was like more of a mystical uh, approach, yeah. To, yeah. You know, closer to a religion, really. Even though we think of Pythagoras as a, as a philosopher, it was really yeah. kind of closer to a religious mystic so but broadly speaking i think you're right that that is in in um in a religion uh the rational approach is subordinate to the faith uh, to the faith component mm -hmm. right? i mean the, uh, think about all the the great uh christian theologians you know including thomas aquinas for instance they would say that of course from their perspective the the rational and the faith component eventually converge in the same in the same place uh, but if they don't it's the faith that trumps the the rational approach on the other hand for somebody who practices a explicitly philosophical as as distinct from mm -hmm. religious uh, way of life such as an existentialist or a secular humanist or something like that in that case uh, there is really ideally no faith component at all it's all about figuring out uh, how to live your life by by way of reason so so you are broadly right but i think that there is also a continuum there and some kind of overlap yeah okay and when we will talk about uh, stoicism too and how important you know re reasoning for them is uh, so the, the way i am i am thinking about this is the difference between uh, religion and the philosophy of Life is more like uh, there is an authority. So, for example, in, in Islam, there is fasting, right, during the Ramadan. But right. Stoics also tell us that fasting is a good idea, right? So right. Like yeah. um, the voluntary discomfort, uh, that kind of a thing, in order to, exactly. uh, you know. However, that's an interesting example, because that actually also helped us draw a distinction, again, mm -hmm. uh, not, maybe not a sharp distinction, but a distinction, nonetheless, between religious practices and philosophical practices because uh muslims or or catholics catholic also you know christians also in the, uh, do the fastings from time to time the reason you do that is to purify your soul and as a kind of a, a, a way of uh, of um uh uh, of putting into practice in a sense your your respect mm -hmm. for god right so you're doing it for for god you're not doing it for yourself really mm -hmm. um, in the case of a philosophy like stoicism you're doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. It is a way to improve your own uh, self-control, your own temperance, uh, which is one of the fundamental virtues in, in Greek philosophy, Greek and Roman philosophy. So the practice is similar, fasting, but the reason you do it is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, today I have read, I, I think maybe today you posted it or, or yesterday, I mean, with Turkey time, uh, the skepticism and stoicism, uh post right you, right. you, you posted yes. and, and then you also that there you quote uh, seneca says that the the old philosophers they are not our masters right they are our teachers but they are not our masters so we can question them if there is a better way you know to practice this we can but when in religion for example about fasting in uh, in the ramadan in islam you are you are not supposed you are supposed to do that right you're just supposed to do that but uh in stasis it is more like so then we say uh so there is a metaphysics how the world is and then there is a component of what kind of a person should I be? And then there is another component of how can I become that kind of person that I am? Correct. Okay. That's exactly right. 
All right. So then we have that as a uh, philosophy, as a way of life. And I know that your, you know, uh, philosophy of life is stoicism. But it's modern stoicism, of course, not ancient stoicism as taken as it is, right? Right. As I just mentioned, uh, we can question them and then uh, we can maybe build on them based on scientific knowledge that we have accumulated uh, through the centuries. So can you tell us a little bit about what stoicism is as a uh, philosophy, as a philosophical practice? Yeah, stoicism is one of the uh, major Greek and Roman uh, philosophies that came out of the Hellenistic period. Uh, there was, in fact, a an explosion of philosophies, uh, practical philosophies in, during that period. The Hellenistic period goes from, roughly speaking, from the death of Alexander the Great and the collapse of the Macedonian Empire to the Battle of Actium, uh, where uh, Octavian, the future emperor Augustus, uh, mm -hmm. defeated you know, Mark Antony and Cleopatra. So that's between the end of the, of the Macedonian Empire and the beginning of the Roman Empire, essentially. In that period, that was a period of turmoil a period where things were changing at a global scale very rapidly and people felt they had no control over what was going on, right? And that is a moment uh, when people do turn to either religion or philosophy. When things are out of control, when you feel like your life is completely chaotic and, and there is, uh, you know, you, 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 don't, you don't seem to affect any, uh, uh, any your decisions and seem to affect anything then that that is when people turn to religions or uh, philosophies so probably that explains the explosion of philosophies in the hellenistic period so stoicism was one of those and it was explicitly a socratic philosophy meaning that the stoics thought of themselves as followers of socrates and so a lot of what stoicism is about it's really an elaboration and an expansion of certain strands of socratic thought in particular one of the fundamental ideas of Stoicism is that the only good, true good in life is virtue, mm -hmm. essentially your character. That's the only true, true good. Everything else can be preferable, you know, can be preferred or dispreferred, uh, but it doesn't, really, it doesn't really rise to the level of good, which is a counterintuitive, very counterintuitive notion, right? Because we are told, we grew up and we're told that things that are good are things like health and uh, your career and your relationships and money. Uh, you know, that sort of stuff. For the Stoics, all of those things are certainly preferable, meaning that it's better to be healthy than sick, it's better to be wealthy than poor, it's better to be educated than ignorant, it's better to have a good career than not, and so on and so forth, right? However, those are not the things that actually characterize you, you as a human being. What characterizes you, you as a human being is your, your character. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in fact, your character is what allows you to use those, all those things properly. Mm -hmm. uh, Epictetus, who was uh, one of the prominent Stoic philosophers in the early part of the second century, put it this way. He said, you know, the point is to play ball like Socrates do, did. And what does he mean by that? He says, no, the ball, it's, when you play ball, the ball itself is not important. It, comes, it can come in different, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, colors and you know weight and materials and you know that all those it doesn't matter mm -hmm. the important thing is what you do with the ball is your skills basically right if you're mm -hmm. a good player uh what is important is your skill not not the specific thing uh, that happens mm -hmm. the ball. so similarly for the stoics at least what is important is not these externals such as health and wealth and reputation etc but how you use them uh, so, mm -hmm. for instance, even though health is other things being equal, a preferred uh, thing, right? So, you, as I said, you'd rather be healthy than not. Mm -hmm. Well, that, however, is true only if you're actually a good person who therefore uses that health in order to help people and et cetera, et cetera. But if you happen to be a bad person or mm -hmm. an awful person, that actually mm -hmm. health is a dispreferred mm -hmm. uh, you know, everybody else would actually rather you be sick so that you don't, uh -huh. don't cause that much, uh, you know, damage to the world. The same goes with wealth. I mean, you can use wealth properly to help other people to make the world a better place, or you can use it to exploit people, in which case it becomes a dispreferred, in, uh, uh, as, as the Stoics call it, indifferent, meaning uh, what they mean by indifferent is that it is morally indifferent, right? It's morally neutral. Uh, it becomes this preferred because then now you're using your wealth in order to actually exploit or undermine other people. Mm -hmm. And it is this preferred even, it should be this preferred even by you 
because you should realize that it's actually, it's actually undermining your own character. You may think that you don't care about mm. it, mm. but you're doing damage to yourself. Uh, mm. an, an analogy, perhaps to understand the concept better, might be made with food. Mm -hmm. So food, other things being equal, is, of course, a preferred thing, right? You, you should eat because otherwise you're going to starve. Mm -hmm. However, the kind of food you eat is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so you want healthy food. You don't want junk food. And the choice between healthy and junk food depends on yourself, on your decisions, on your judgment. You are the one that makes that choice. Now, somebody might say, but I like junk food. I like to, you know, French fries or something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you might like them, but they are not good for you. Because yeah. if you keep eating them, they will undermine your health. Eventually, you're going to have a heart attack or, you know, you're going to be obese or something like that. Similarly, for the stoic, a person, a bad person who prefers to do bad things mm -hmm. and they say, you know, hey, I'm perfectly fine being doing bad things. Look at that. I'm actually enjoying it. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that they're actually undermining their own character, their own soul, in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're essentially eating junk food all the time. Mm -hmm. So eventually they will suffer from it. They just don't realize it. All right. So um, the person who eats junk food also wants to be healthy, right? So he right. cares about being healthy. So right. now one question might be, why should I care about being a virtuous person? Right. So what kind of yeah. damage are we talking about? Right. Yeah. So it's again, it, the, the analogy is, is uh, uh, I think, uh, enlightening, meaning that, as you just say, everybody wants to be healthy, mm -hmm. but some people still make bad choices. Right. Either mm -hmm. either out of ignorance because they don't know better uh, mm -hmm. or out of weakness of the will, as Aristotle mm -hmm. would put it. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like, ah, I have I have the junk food in my house and I can't mm -hmm. stop myself from eating, it, even though I know actually it's, it's bad for me. Right. For the Stoics, it, the same exact thing happens with good and bad actions, with virtuous and non-virtuous actions. And what you're undermining is your character. So if you, if you do bad things on a regular basis, mm -hmm. if you lie to people, let's say, right? If you're untrustworthy, et cetera, you undermine your character because once you start lying, it's easier to continue lying in the same, in the same way in which once you start eating french fries it's easy to continue it's hard to stop eating french fries right and you get used to it mm -hmm. that getting used to it that finding it easier and easier is a is a sign that you're actually affecting affecting negatively your own character now why is that negative well because mm -hmm. at the end of the day we live in a society and human beings are highly social and human beings are highly interdependent from other people mm -hmm. and if you start developing the the Mm. Uh, reputation that you are untrustworthy that you're lying all the time then people are going to stay away from you you're not you're going to have a hard time developing good relationships you know finding friends and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, trusting other people because if if other people find you untrustworthy then then it's going to be difficult to mm -hmm. establish relationships with other people so ultimately it really damages you mm. at, the, at the end of the day yeah but but this sounded a little bit like uh, Epicureans who say that you should be virtuous because if you don't, then you can't have, have a happy life because of these kind of reasons, right? So right. this sounded like uh, what is bad in lying or non-virtuous actions or behaviors is that uh, they have bad consequences, which means they're instrumentally bad, right? Rather than having it is bad in itself for you. Uh, right. th th that's how I, I was, I, I thought, because... Um, so they also say that the, the slogan is living according to nature, right? Yes. In accordance with nature. Okay. So then um, the only, as you said, the only thing is virtue, right? The only thing that is actually good, really good, right? Uh, is, is virtue or living a virtuous life, which is in accordance with nature. So then this kind of character traits, like being a liar, uh, or not caring about other people or getting pleasure from other people's misfortunes, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. They are supposed to be um, not in accordance with right. nature, right? So can you explain right. a little bit? That yeah, part? No, that, that you're making very good points, but but it is a little bit complicated. So so let's, okay. um, let's first go back to my statement that uh, if you are unvirtuous, you're undermining yourself because okay. then people are going to find, you know, find you, uh, you know, an unreliable character. And then I, however, I do want to get back to the 
living according to nature because that's a that's a that's an interesting point so first of all I was making actually, in fact, a distinction here at this point between the ancient Stoics and the, and the modern Stoics. Oh, okay. Some modern Stoics. Ancient Stoics, you're right. They, they would say, unlike the Epicureans, they would say that virtue is the, the, the only intrinsic good. It's the thing that is good in, in and of itself. However, they were criticized for that st statement mm -hmm. already in ancient times, not just by the Epicureans, but also from, uh, by the uh, academic skeptics. Mm -hmm. The skeptics, Carnieres, for instance, in Athens, and in fact, Cicero in Rome, uh, they thought, wait a minute, wh what do you mean that, that virtue is the, the telos of life, meaning it's the, the yeah. whole point of life? Like, what are you doing virtues for? Uh, go back for, to my analogy, for instance, actually, Epictetus' analogy with the ball. Well, well, it's true that, as Epictetus says, the ball itself is not important, right? That what's important is your skill. How do you skillfully play the ball? but you're skillfully playing the ball because you want to score, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not just that you want to play. If, if you play skillfully for, you know, for, its own, for its own sake, nobody's going to come see you. It's not that interesting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that you play skillfully because you want to win the game, because you want to actually score points, yeah. right? Yeah. So virtue becomes then instrumental. The ancient Stoics would have rejected that notion. They would okay. have said, no, it's, it's, it's intrinsically good as it is. Virtue is intrinsically good as it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have further goals. But they run into trouble there already in ancient time. Now, modern, uh, mm -hmm. modern Stoics have discussions about this. Some mm -hmm. modern Stoics stick with the original uh, idea that's like, no, virtue is good in and of itself. And mm -hmm. other modern uh, practitioners of stoicism, including myself, are saying, no, actually, you know what? The, the, mm -hmm. the skeptics have a, at a point. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you want to be virtuous because that actually hand allows you to handle well all the externals, such as health, mm -hmm. wealth, etc. Okay. Now, that said, the, even a modern stoic position is still different from the Epicurean, because in, in this sense, that even though virtue becomes instrumental in both cases, mm -hmm. it's instrumental toward different things. For the Epicurean, as you know, what's important is to live a life without pain. The highest pleasure for Epicurus was a life without pain, especially mental pain. Right? Yeah. So what they've called ataraxia, a state of ataraxia, a state of tranquility, right? You're not bothered by anything, basically. Mm -hmm. For the Stoics, ataraxia is not the goal even for modern Stoics. The, the, the goal is to live pro-socially. That is to realize that we are a member of a society and that we, are, we need to be mm -hmm. helpful to other people. Mm -hmm. We need to improve the human cosmopolis, as they put it. Mm -hmm. so, so the goal for a Stoics, even a modern Stoic, is to make the human cosmopolis, human society at large, a better place. And you do it by being virtuous, by acting mm -hmm. virtuously. Which brings me to, finally, to the... Uh, Mm -hmm. living according to nature bit so living according to nature is a slogan that actually several uh ancient Hellenistic schools did have either explicitly or imp implicitly for instance the epicureans themselves thought that they were living according to nature uh it's just that what differentiates in a sense what differentiated different Hellenistic schools was what they meant by that phrase what, what yeah. does it mean to live by nature so, for instance, the Epicureans would make the argument that it is natural for human beings to avoid pain and to seek pleasure. And that therefore, living according to nature means avoiding pain and seeking pleasure, right? So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the basic Epicurean uh, point. The Stoics response, I thought, I think there was actually very, fairly, fairly good and, and, and fairly sophisticated. And they would say, well, yes. It certainly is in agreement. Pain, pain is against nature, as the Seneca mm -hmm. himself says, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, who was, of course, a Stoic uh, philosopher of the first century. Uh, Seneca says, yes, pain is against nature, meaning that other things being equal, you don't want to experience pain. Mm -hmm. And pleasure is in agreement with nature, meaning that other things being equal, you want to exp experience pleasure. However, the Stoics would point out that human beings have higher goals Mm -hmm. than pain and pleasure. That is, pain and pleasure themselves are actually instrumental to do certain mm -hmm. things. For instance, um, let's say that I decide that, you know, I'm getting a little bit out of shape here. I need to uh, go to the gym and, you know, start, start, start eating more healthy and, and, and etc. Well, going to the gym is painful. 
It's not, it's not a pleasure, at least not for me. Okay. Yeah. Some people, for some people, it's a pleasure. I don't understand that part. But mm -hmm. for me, it certainly isn't. Uh, it is a pain, but it is the kind of pain that I am okay with because it fulfills, it helps me fulfill yeah. a higher goal, which is that of becoming healthier. Right. Yeah. And so the Stoics would say, yeah, pleasure and pain are important, but they are subordinate to the real goal. And the real goal is, again, to live a pro-social life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you, uh, you want to live a pro-social life, and that means, for instance, uh, you're going to get involved in politics, uh, or, or, you know, uh, which is something that the Epicureans explicitly yeah. said we shouldn't do because it is, as we know, painful. Yeah. Uh, right? The Stoics, on the other hand, said, no, you should do it. You should do it because politics, in, not in the sense that you need to become a politician necessarily, but you need to be uh, engaging in politics in the broad Aristotelian sense of the term, that mm -hmm. is being concerned with the polis, with, with your society, right? So do things that are pro-social, that are good for society. That means to be involved in, in politics from a Stoic perspective. You should, you ought to do that. You have a duty to do that for a Stoic. Why? Because again, the goal is to make this a better world for everybody, not just for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think uh, yeah I, I think I agree with you about all this. Uh, the, the the virtue, for example, virtue. The way I d define virtue is uh, virtue is a character trait that um, uh, that leads a person to make the world a better place, right? That kind of a, so so it's a consequentialist definition of virtue, which actually fits with uh, your uh, idea of to live a pro-social life is the Yes. Is what to live a to live in accordance with nature means, right? Exactly. With our pro-social or social nature, in accordance with our social nature, or, or and also rational nature, right? So rational and uh, social nature. But so um, we when we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, what is good and what is bad, right? So there were some uh, examples. Um, so for example, wealth or reputation or things like that actually they do not belong to my character right but uh, sometimes i we think that they are good for us uh, but those examples were all what is good for me but there is also a concern about what is good for others right, right. so then when we say virtue or like the ancient stoics maybe virtue is the only good that good is like among all the things that i think that are good for me no, only virtue is really good for me. But what about someone else's pain? Isn't it in itself bad? Or should we just say uh, this preferred indifferent? Or should we say it is really bad? Someone's uh, experiencing injustice and things like that. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great question. So for the Stoic, I think even a modern Stoic, both my own pain and other people's pain is an indifferent. But mm -hmm. notice that I'm putting this in scare uh -huh. quotes, right? Uh -huh. Because people immediately hear the word indifference. Like, what do you mean? You don't care yeah. about the fact that other people... Are... No, that's not what yeah. I mean. What I mean is that um, my, my own pain, as well as other people's pain, is morally neutral with respect to my character. Mm -hmm. Being in pain doesn't make me a bad person, nor does it make me a good person. Other people's pain don't make me a good person and don't make them a good person. And other people's pleasures don't make me a good person. They don't make them a, a, good, a good person. So in that sense, they're indifferent. Mm -hmm. However, yes, of course, I should care about the fact that people, other people are in pain and, mm -hmm. uh, or, or that the, I should be helpful in a way that they actually experience a good life, a fulfilling life, et cetera, et cetera. That is what it means to help the human cosmopolis we want to make the, the point of stoicism is to make the, the world a better place for everybody as far as it is possible for us to actually contribute to a better mm -hmm. world so in that sense stoicism uh, is very much other oriented which is kind of interesting because a lot of modern stoics unfortunately yeah. uh, tend to think of stoicism as as inward uh, you know, as, uh -huh. as, uh, as um, focused on the self. I mean, you, we keep hearing a lot about self-help, for instance, yeah. uh, about life hacking, you know, all that sort of stuff. But that is a misconception of Stoicism. Stoicism isn't self-help. In fact, mm -hmm. if anything, Stoicism is other help. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, if you read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, he's always, of, often concerned with making the world a better place. You know, how can I make my fellow human beings, uh, you know, life better? Mm -hmm. So, so this whole notion that I, which which I called um, I call a Silicon Valley stoicism. This this yeah. notion that uh, you know stoicism is going to good be good because it's going to help you uh, become a good entrepreneur or a, a yeah, millionaire yeah. or something. And you know, like I, I read an in, an article in business, I think it was Business Insider uh, some time ago, where, where they claimed that Jeff Bezos is a good example of a stoic. I said, yeah. if there's one person yeah. who's not a good example of, of stoic, that is Jeff Bezos. Uh, as far as I can tell from what I read about him, of course, yeah. I don't know him personally, so I could be mistaken. But, you know, this is a person who is, yes, indeed, very successful. Sure, he's a billionaire, he's one of the most, you know, richest men in the world. But arguably, he has arrived at that uh, wealth by exploiting other people, and specifically Amazon, uh, you know, employees. Yeah. And that, for the Stoic, is bad. <laughs> yes. you, you are you're undermining your own character. Also, I doubt, again, I, I could be wrong, because I don't know Bezos personally, but I seriously doubt that uh, Bezos' top priority is to become a better person. Yeah. I think his priorities are all, are, tend to be, again, at least from what we hear and read about him, hedonistic. You know, hmm. he, he wants more pleasure. He wants more money. He wants more fame. He wants more wealth, and so on and so forth. Those are that's, those are all hedonist uh, goals that they have nothing to do with with stoicism. So, and in fact, I don't think they have anything to do with Epicureanism either. I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call Bezos an Epicurean yeah. either. And yeah. it's not, you know, even even the Epicureans would say, no, that's not that's not a good life as far as yeah. they're concerned. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yes, so, so you mentioned one uh, misconception of Stoicism like this. Uh, another is sometimes people say Stoicism is all about being emotionless, like robotic, right? Just do whatever is rational, just live your life rationally and without any emotions. Can you say, say, say a little bit about Yeah, that? so so there is a, that's a misconception. However, as a lot of misconceptions, it is based on a grain of truth. And I do mm -hmm. think that Stoics there do have a problem, which again was pointed out by other schools mm -hmm. uh, at the time and, and by some of the modern critics of, Stoic, of Stoicism. So here's, here's the, gra the grain of truth. Well, the grain of truth is that Stoics really do try to modulate their emotional spectrum in a way that stays away from extremes. Mm -hmm. For a Stoic, being is... Uh, so let me back up for a second here. Stoics actually divide emotions into three categories. Mm -hmm. And this division is actually very helpful because it, uh, it happens to be as, uh, in, in, in pretty good agreement with modern uh, cognitive science, with modern, modern psychology. The three types, the three categories of emotions are what they call proto-emotions, unhealthy emotions, and healthy emotions. So a proto-emotion is a automatic reaction that we have and that we cannot control. For instance, if I uh, say something that is embarrassing to you and you blush, that's a proto-emotion. Your, your blushing is a physiological manifestation of a proto-emotion. Mm -hmm. Or if I say something that is going to hurt your feelings and you get angry, and you mm -hmm. feel this kind of rage swelling inside you, that response also is a proto-emotion. You cannot stop it. You cannot avoid it. No. You cannot suppress it. You can't do anything about it. You just have to let it go. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the proto-emotion. So mm -hmm. the Stoics are not concerned with the proto-emotions precisely because you cannot control them. Yeah, they, it is something that happens to you, right? It has something that happens to you. And just yeah. you have to just accept it for what, yeah. what, what it is. However... The proto-emotion then develops into a fully formed emotion. And the fully formed emotions can be unhealthy or healthy. Mm -hmm. And the way in which a proto-emotion turns into a fully formed emotion is, is because your cognition comes in. You start thinking about that mm -hmm. emotion. You start elaborating on that emotion. And this, this particular bit is very much in agreement with modern cognitive science. Mm -hmm. Of course, modern cognitive science is based on exper extensive experimental observations, and so it's more sophisticated, obviously, than the intuitive kind of psychology mm -hmm. that the ancient Stoics came up with. But it's remarkably similar. I mean, the Stoics did get some things very basically wrong in terms of human physiology and psychology, but they also got some things remarkably right. And this is mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, and it, and it, that's why it's very important. That's why we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that, let's say, uh, uh, 
let's say that we're having a conversation and you, and you say something that is meant to be hurtful to me. You can, it's an insult or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? And I feel inside me this kind of, you know, the, the adrenaline rising and say, what the hell? What is wrong with Tufan? Why is he telling me this kind of thing, right? So that's the proto-emotion. How I react, however, once that I start thinking about it, that is up to me because I could say, oh, look at that. This guy's a jerk. He's, he's trying to get me, you know, riled. And yeah, he's, he's a bad guy. So I really need to get upset. I really need to, you know, start punching or something like that. Mm -hmm. That, at that point, that has turned a proto-emotion into an unhealthy emotion, anger, uh -huh. fully fledged anger. Uh -huh. Or I can tell myself, oh, look at that. He's trying to get a rise out of me, but I'm not going to let him. I yeah. let, and the reason for that is because there is no point in getting upset. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, anger is not you know, a good emotion to display to our fellow human beings. I, I'd rather be helpful uh, mm. to too fun, even though he's trying to get me uh, to respond in a certain way. I think it's much better if we relate to each other in a more positive mm. fashion. So now it is my thinking that is pushing the proto-emotion in the direction of a healthy reaction as opposed to an unhealthy one so that's the basic stoic idea now it does work and we know that it works because the entire approach modern approach of cognitive behavioral therapy or cbt is actually based on the stoic conception of emotion the emotion the fully formed emotions as partially the result of cognition of thinking about stuff right cbt is arguably the most evidence-based successful type of, of psychotherapy we have today and in fact it originally started in in the 1960s as from an inspiration from the stoics the early cbt practitioners were people who actually read epictetus seneca marcus Aurelius, and you know stuff like that and say hey these people were onto something here um, so it does work however the result of this uh, negotiating your your emotions is precisely that you're gonna as a stoic you're trying to get away from a set of unhealthy uh, responses which include anger but also include a lot of other passions a passion is described as an unhealthy emotion that override reasons well you know there are some un, some emotions that the stoics think are unhealthy that a modern psychologist might disagree for instance mm -hmm. grief Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. grief for the stoics is an unhealthy emotion you shouldn't feel grief you should work on your on not feeling grief why well because grief is the result of the the, the uh the suffering that is induced by the fact that somebody a loved one has died let's say mm -hmm. um but we're all mortals we know that people are going to die mm -hmm. and there's nothing you can do about it it's not like like your grief is going to somehow bring those people back to life so why are you wasting your time and energy mm -hmm. uh, essentially in yeah but the problem but 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 the thing is it would be really strange if let's say my wife died or my 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 parents and i felt nothing and i and i felt like oh well you know they just died that's that's life yes it is life but it's not a pleasant part of life <laughs> it's a part of life that actually does cause grief now what the stoics did get right there is that you shouldn't indulge in grief mm -hmm. right you shouldn't uh grief should be it's a normal reaction which for a certain period of time is fine but beyond a certain period of time then it becomes uh sort of self-indulging it becomes paralyzing becomes crippling there is a uh, seneca wrote about this he wrote a famous letter of consolation to his friend um uh, marcia who had lost an adult son and he tells us exactly this he, he says look, you've been grieving now for two or three years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's too much. Now you got to get out of it because mm -hmm. what's happening is not only that your son, of course, is not coming back, that's a given, but mm -hmm. grief is now getting in the way of your own life. Mm -hmm. uh, because of your grief, you're not paying attention to your other children. You're not mm -hmm. paying attention to your friends. You're not paying attention to your husband. You're not carrying out your social duties. Now, you, so in other words, you are actually undermining the human cosmopolis. You're not doing your job mm -hmm. as a human being, right? Mm -hmm. And it is grief that is causing you that. So all, all in all, I think that they had a point, Stoics had a point in terms of there are certain emotions that especially if you act on the basis of those emotions, like anger, or if you indulge in those emotions like grief, those are not good for you. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's, that's true. However, there is, there is such a thing as pushing that point 
too far yeah, and, and yeah. say, well, you should never feel those things. You should, you should ideally, you should, you know, the ideal stoic, the sage would never mm. even feel those fully formed emotions. Uh, you can argue that if you don't, you're not a fully formed human being. You, 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 yeah. Now you're going into psychopathic territory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in general, though, we can say that there are these, so they have these unhealthy emotions, healthy emotions. Okay, there are these proto-emotions, pro-pathos, right? So they, they are yeah. uh, just automatic reflex kind of uh, reactions. Um, and then, yes, minimizing the negative emotions, the uh, unhealthy emotions, we can say, um, but then we, 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 there are also positive emotions like joy, right? So, so, so you, the, right. the joy that you get from doing the right thing or something like that, or act, acting virtuously and things like that. Right. So then even, even the ancient um, Stoics, there were some excitement in life, right? So, so still there is, it's not like cold, <laughs> just, just cold, right. calculating kind of robotic kind of life, uh, but just there are no, or ideally, there are no, pathological emotions uh, that actually undermine your character and uh, take you away from acting rationally, right? That, that, that kind of a thing. But that yes, yeah, that part is the misconception, right? So just yes. robotic. That's right. That's definitely not robotic. And in fact, again, again, explicitly so. I mean, there is a point, for instance, in Epictetus, where he says to one of his students, it's like, you know, I don't want you not to feel anything because that would turn mm -hmm. you into a statue. <laughs> so so yeah they actually explicitly say so however there is a point to the criticism even there even in terms of the, mm. the healthy emotions because mm. if you look at the healthy emotions those are fairly limited in number yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they're very circumscribed right so for instance yeah. you say joy yeah well, when i when we say joy is in fact one of the healthy stoic emotions but it's a very particular kind of joy it's joy uh. at feeling and doing the right thing right yeah yeah. Okay, well, I can see that. But what about joy? Because, you know, my daughter just got offered a job, for instance, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh, and it's uh -huh. good for her career. Could uh -huh. I, should I not, um, you know, enjoy that sort mm -hmm. of, you know, should I not have a positive reaction to that? And the mm -hmm. stars will say, well, no, because that's, that's not, that's not really a virtuous kind of mm -hmm. uh, emotion. That's reaction. an indifferent, right? It's, it's an indifferent. And yeah. I want to say, well, but if I don't feel joy, for uh, my daughter's accomplishment, then there is something a little odd about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a father, right? There is something mm -hmm. off as a father. The same goes with love, for instance. You know, so love is a positive emotion. It's a healthy emotion as far as the stoics are concerned. But they're not talking about romantic love. They're mm -hmm. talking only about the uh, mature kind of love that you might develop for in a relationship, for sure, with, with a partner or for a friend. Yes, mm -hmm. but... We all know as human beings that you don't get there instantly. Mm. You mm. have in order to get there, you actually pass through some of what they would consider the unhealthy emotion. In the case of a relationship, for instance, mm. typically, not always, but typically it starts with lust. Mm -hmm. Right. And lust for the Stoics is definitely an unhealthy emotion because it overrides your reasoning abilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would say as a modern person who is interested in you know, who's practices stoics, I would say, look, first of all, lust is unavoidable. As it, as it turns out. I mean, you, you cannot avoid being attractive sexually to, to a certain, certain people. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to cultivate it, to let it go, to let it, you know, to nurture it, so long as you keep in mind that you don't want to act, uh, you know, make certain decisions on the basis of lust. Like, you mm -hmm. don't propose, for instance, marriage or moving in together mm -hmm. just because you had sex with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. that, that would be... Uh, obviously, you know, uh, a unhealthy emotion getting in the way of, of your life. But lust in and of itself, I see nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And, and so there is, there is something there that the Stoics, I think, need to work, uh, work on in that, in that sense. Yeah. They, they do have the right idea, meaning that some emotions are unhealthy. And if you act on the basis of those unhealthy emotions, you're going to probably get yourself into trouble. Mm -hmm. But I think they they still try to limit too much the range of human emotional responses, so that no, you don't become a robot, but mm -hmm. but you're you're getting a little into that direction. Yeah, yeah. That direction. yeah. And can we say that uh, there is already even in the ancient Stoics there is this kind of um, you know uh, diversity of uh, opinions? So, for example, according to Epictetus. 
uh, if I if I am correct, um, the indifference, right? Uh, if if some if something doesn't make you a better person, then don't do it. But for Seneca, if it doesn't doesn't make you a bad person, a worse person, then you can do it. Correct. Right? So so that kind of a diversity, and I, I think we can have that kind of diversity also in what you just said, right? About our um, approach to emotions, uh, different emotions. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and that is one. There is one reason why, although I very much uh, you know, appreciate Epictetus, he's, 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 he was the one that actually got me into Stoicism in the first mm-hmm. place. I mean, if you read Epictetus, he's he's funny. He's, he has a sense of humor bordering on sarcasm. Uh, yeah. He's very much in your face. He just tells you what he thinks, yeah. and there's no no you know, it's very clear. Uh, he, he's uh, he, it's very compelling uh, in the way in which he interacts with his students. And so it's easy to uh, think of Epictetus as like, you know, that that's the kind of guy that I that I want to be. However, if you read Seneca, he's much more compassionate. He's more human. Mm-hmm. He's more, uh, he, he, you know, he admits his failures. He mm-hmm. says, you know, I'm, I, I'm just trying here. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm trying to do my best. And in fact, in a sense, Seneca was a little bit more of an eclectic uh, mm-hmm. He certainly was a stoic. He certainly considered himself a stoic. There's no question about it. But Mm. you're right. It's a different type of stoicism from Epictetus. This shouldn't be surprising uh, because stoicism evolved over five or six centuries from the late fourth century BC to the second or third century of the modern era. And so different authors were developing ideas in different ways. Even in the early, so-called early stoa, the very early stoics, uh, like Zeno, who was the founder of Stoicism, had disagreements with his first student, Cleanthes, hmm. uh, and then with, his, with another one of his famous students, Chrysippus. And then later on, so-called middle Stoics like Panicius and Posidonius were also in disagreement on certain things with the early Stoics. And as you mentioned a few minutes ago, Seneca actually literally says in one of his letters to his friend Lucilius, he says, we should not think of those that came before us as our masters, but only as our teachers. And if we discover something new or a better way of doing things, then we should do it, right? It's, it's a very rational, it's a very reasonable kind of approach to things. Epictetus comes out a little strong, stronger from that, from that yeah. perspective. Epictetus yeah. a little bit more. In fact, often scholars do think that Epictetus returns, he's one of the late Stoics. Mm-hmm. In fact, he's the last great Stoic other than Marcus Aurelius. And a lot of um, scholars think that Epictetus actually goes back to the early Stoa, especially to the mm-hmm. Stoa of Chrysippus. Uh, mm-hmm. While Seneca is a little bit more, you know, he goes in the different yeah. directions. He, even um, in, uh, in several of the early letters to Lucilius, he wrote 120, well, there are 124 surviving letters to his friend. He probably wrote more. And in several of the early uh, letters, he, he uh, ends the letter quoting, uh, favorably quoting Epicurus. Right. Mm-hmm. And at some point, uh, his friend Lucius must have objected or at least pointed it out because we have a letter from Seneca. We don't have, unfortunately, the letters from Lucilius, but the, there is a letter from Seneca where he says, oh, yeah, you, you, you keep asking me, why, why do I you know, quote Epicurus? After all, he's not a Stoic. And Seneca's response is kind of interesting. He says, I wander into enemy camp, not mm-hmm. as a traitor, but as a scout. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. like, hey, if Epicurus had, and then he adds, he adds, uh, the truth is is everybody's property. It's not it's only one person. So if, yeah. if if Epicurus discovers something that is truthful and useful, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter that it's that it's Epicurus. Yeah. It's yeah. Ra- the reasonable thing to do is to take it on yeah. and use yeah. and use it. And there are in fact a lot of similarities between Epicureanism and, and Stoicism, especially in the way in which they think of death. Mm, yes yeah when seneca talks about death and he says uh you know we should not be concerned with with being dead because there's not going to be any sensation there uh Mm -hmm. we should not be in fact all these stories that you hear uh from priests about what happens after life they're all made up uh, Mm -hmm. and the only point of of those stories is to control you that's Mm -hmm. basically epicurus (laughs) epicurus writes exactly the same kind of things uh so there is a very strong agreement there between the two schools at least on that particular uh respect all right um so actually this links to the one of the questions that i received so i asked if you have any questions for uh masano and uh, there were some uh one question was about religion so 
can we have a religion and then be a stoic without giving up that religion, right? That was a question. So we know that ancient stoics were pantheists, right? Logos, the Zeus, nature, you know, God, all the same thing. Um, so today's uh, modern stoics, they don't tend to, you know, be pantheistic. It's more uh, like a more a- any kind of uh, view is welcome as far as I can see. Yeah. Now you also just mentioned their views about afterlife, right? So, so they didn't think that there were there was other. So, what do you think? So, can someone be a member of, a, for example, like an Abrahamic religion and also be a Stoic? In my mind, yes, um, but there is disagreement about this. I mean, there are mm-hmm. there are some Christian authors, for instance, or modern Christian authors who have written about this, and they, uh, at least one of them, suggests that no, that's not possible because mm-hmm. fundamentally there are some metaphysical. Hmm. you know, uh, very metaphysical, very different opinions, but different positions at a metaphysical level, and they're not reconcilable. So that's the end of the story. But I think that's a little too rigid. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, even the early Christian fathers realized that Stoicism was very close to Christianity, unlike Epicureanism, right? The, hmm. the early Christians really hated Epicureans. They, 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 they rejected the whole Epicurean approach for a number hmm. of reasons. First of all, because there was an emphasis on pleasure, which didn't go well with Christianity. Hmm. And second of all, because of uh, Epicurean metaphysics, you know, these notions, hmm. which the Epicureans were atomists. So hmm. they were materialists. They thought that, you know, things happen by randomly, you know, and atoms randomly bumping into each other. That whole thing just didn't work with either Christian ethics or Christian metaphysics. Mm-hmm. But the early Christian authors, in fact, all the way throughout the Middle Ages, in, all the way to uh, Thomas Aquinas, but from Paul of Tarsus to uh, Augustine to uh, Avipas to uh, Thomas Aquinas, they actually took a lot of, uh, from, from the Stoics. Uh, Stoic ethics worked well for them because it was about virtue, because it was about duty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stoic metaphysics worked okay because the Stoics, as you mentioned, were talking about the logos. And yes, for the Stoics, the logos was the generating principle of the universe. Right. So as you pointed out, by modern standards, the ancient Stoics would would be considered uh, pantheists. However, you know, it's not by chance that uh, I think it is the Gospel of John begins literally with in the beginning was the word and mm-hmm. the word was God, and the word word is the Greek logos there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, the Christians were very conscious of the fact that there were a lot of similarities, a lot of things mm-hmm. that were mm-hmm. Stoicism. And in fact, they often wrote favorably about Stoic philosophers or Stoic figures. Uh, you know, uh, several Christian authors talked about Seneca as our Seneca even mm-hmm. though Seneca was not a Christian. Yeah. Uh, Dante puts Cato the Younger, who was a Stoic uh, role model at the beginning of Purgatory, at the entrance of Purgatory. So not in hell. He's the only pagan that is not in hell uh, okay. in, the entire, in the entire comedy. So I think you can, see, you can make an argument, at least, that there is a compatibility between the Abrahamic traditions, mm-hmm. particularly Christianity, um, but possibly the other two as well, uh, and Stoicism. And I have friends like my co-author, Greg Lopez, for instance, he's the co-author of the handbook for new Stoics. And, you know, he's a Buddhist and yet he practices mm-hmm. Stoicism. Mm-hmm. So, so I think there is a compatibility there. To some extent, it all depends on how rigidly you yeah. interpret both the philosophy and the religion. Yeah. Yeah. If you're willing yeah. to make some compromise and you're going to say, look, uh, Stoic metaphysics, I'm going to call the logos God, uh-huh. then you're fine. But if, you're, if you tend to be a little bit more strict and you say, well, no, if the only way to be a Stoic is to be a pantheist, then, then the two become incompatible. Mm-hmm. But for instance, I myself am certainly not a pantheist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm an atheist. And, and yet I do think I interpret the logos as the set of the laws of nature. That's okay. What is sometimes referred to as Einstein's God, because uh, Einstein was famously asked, you know, do you believe in God? And he said, yeah, I believe in the laws of nature. Mm-hmm. So if you think of the logos as the, again, the, at the broader, at the highest possible level of definition, as simply the generative generative principle of the universe, yeah. and uh, you can say, uh, okay, I can call that God. I can uh-huh. call that uh, your cosmic living organism, as the Stoics, the ancient Stoics did, or I can call it the laws of nature, and it's still the logos. Uh, so, but in their in their view, uh, there was also the universe was good, right, according to them. 
the universe yeah. was good. There was a, a positive value to so so then whatever the the nature does or the uh, universe does. Uh, because the nature is rational and it is good for the universe and whatever is good for the universe is also good for us and whatever is good for us is good for the... So that kind of organic relationship like an organ and the body, that kind of a thing. Do you think that kind of an approach, that kind of pantheism, right? do you think that is that was essential for ancient uh, Stoics? And then do you think without that, we can still be uh, Stoics without thinking that the universe is good? Yeah. Yeah, there is disagreement there as well among modern Stoics. No, I don't think that that approach is was even necessary for ancient mm. Stoics. Mm. Okay. And I definitely don't think it's necessary for modern Stoics. Okay. Uh, here's why. If you look at Marcus Aurelius uh, mm -hmm. in the meditations, there are several places, I think I count at least half a dozen, probably more, where he starts with a variation on the following sentence. It's either God or atoms. And the reference there is God is in the sense, in the stoic sense, the, the you know, living organism that is the cosmos, mm -hmm. and atoms in the Epicurean sense. Mm -hmm. It's all atoms bumping into each other. And so he recognizes that there are these two possibilities. These are the two major schools of metaphysics, basically, at the mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. And then he goes on and, say, and says... Well, either way, I still have to get up in the morning and do my job as a human being and be helpful to yeah, the yeah. cosmopolis, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, yeah. this doesn't mean that Marcus was agnostic about mm -hmm. metaphysics. He was not. Very clearly, from again, from the meditations, we know that he actually agreed with the Stoic position, not with the Epicurean position. There's no question about it. So I'm not trying to say that Marcus Aurelius was agnostic about it. Mm -hmm. But he contemplated mm -hmm. the other possibility, right? The, the yeah. yeah. Epicurean one, and and his conclusion was well. Either way, yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta yeah. get up and do the job of a human being. Yeah. So I think that even this indicates to me fairly strongly that even for the ancient Stoics, uh, it was not necessary. That bit of the meta, of the metaphysics of, of, of ancient Stoics was not necessary for the ethics. Uh -huh. It's even less necessary today. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Now, of course, that does have consequences for the ethics. I'm not saying that they're disjunct. I mean, mm. as, as, we, uh, as you probably know, the Stoics insisted that metaphysics and ethics are actually connected yeah, yeah. because it's your understanding of the universe, of the, how the world works, that informs how you behave in the world. And I think that's right, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I reconcile the two, th the two things? Well, there is certain parts of Stoic metaphysics that are still correct. Hmm. And there are certain parts of Stoic ethics that need to be modified. Hmm. The big one is it's their concept of providence. Yeah. And so uh, Epictetus uh, says, for instance, that uh, you should think of yourself as a, as you pointed out a minute ago, as an organ that is part of a larger body, right? He uses this uh, nice metaphor. He says, if you were a, a foot that has to cross the street and the street is muddy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at it from the point of view of just being a foot, that's disgusting. Yeah. Like, why, yeah. why would I want to stab into the mud? But if you remember that you're not just a foot, you're a foot connected with an whole organism, the whole body, and the body has to get home. And the only way to get home is to cross a muddy path. Then not only you're going to do it because it's your mm -hmm. duty as a foot, but you're actually going to do it with pleasure. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're happy to do it. You yeah. embrace your fate as a, as a foot. Why? Because you're doing something good for the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as a modern uh, Stoic practitioner, I don't buy the latter part. I'm going to say, well, mm -hmm. uh, no, I am, I, 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 there will be certain things that I need to do and that are unpleasant and they are in, unavoidable. So I'm going to do them, but I'm going to do them because they're unavoidable. I'm not going to embrace them. Mm -hmm. uh, the best example probably is uh, you know, if one of my loved ones dies, Epicurus says, sorry, Epictetus says, uh, you should not be disturbed. Right? Mm -hmm. If your wife, he says, if your wife dies, if your, uh, if your son or daughter dies, you should not be disturbed. Now, people often look at that particular bit and say, well, this guy was a psychopath. Well, what do you mean? I should not yeah. be disturbed, right? But he had a point. From the point of view of ancient Stoic ethics and metaphysics, of course, you should not be disturbed because Whatever happens is mm. for the good of the universe, yeah, yeah. including, unfortunately, your loved ones dying. So you might not like it, uh, but, it but if you remember that it's for good, the good of the universe, it's the providence in that sense, then not only you're going to accept it, you're actually going to embrace it. 
That's a wonderful sentiment. It's really helpful. Unfortunately, I cannot bring myself to believe that the universe is a, uh, is a, is a good place in general. I think the universe is morally neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. So the, the, uh, my position as a modern practitioner, therefore, is oh, if, if my, one of my loved ones is going to die, I am going to be disturbed. Uh, mm-hmm. just, and in fact, I should be disturbed. However, I should also accept it mm-hmm. because it is inevitable, because I understand that death is a part of the natural cycle. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, therefore, I will accept it, but I will not embrace it. Yeah. So, so there are some things mm-hmm. I think that you can reject of ancient uh, Stoic metaphysics because they're not tenable anymore that do have consequences from Stoic ethics. But it doesn't mean you're not practicing Stoics and Stoicism anymore. You're just saying you're doing in a different fashion. You're doing a different. And and frankly, you know, a lot of some people are disturbed by this notion of practicing Stoicism in, in the 21st century in a different way from which, you know, in, in Epictetus was practicing Stoicism. But I don't understand that point because nobody practices today mm-hmm. anything in the way people practiced yeah, 2,000 yeah. years ago. You're yeah. not a Christian today in the way in which people were Christian 2,000 years ago. You're not a, 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 a you know, Jew in the, in the way in which people were, or, or Buddhist in, which, in the way in which mm-hmm. people were Buddhist two and a half millennia ago. So why should you be a Stoic in the way, yeah, in, yeah. precisely in the way in which Epictetus was? No. All right, uh, so we are out of time, but one last question I have, because we talked about the metaphysics of Stoicism, and we talked about the ethics, and you said in a uh, practical, pr- practical philosophy or a philosophy of life, there is also a set of practices to help us become the person that we are supposed to become, right? Okay. Um, and, and that's why, as, as I mentioned, sometimes people, you mentioned too, uh, that it is directed to the person and sounds selfish maybe, but the, the uh, analogy I use is like taking care of a tree, right? When you take care of a tree, then the fruits, everyone will benefit from the fruits, but the way you do it is you take care of the tree. So you Absolutely. focus on the tree. So you focus on your character, but then because you are becoming a more virtuous person, then actually you are contributing to the world by that. So right. my last question, Stoics had many, many different practices, exercises, right? That kind of a thing. Um, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but which one is your favorite as a practicing modern uh, Stoic among the different exercises, Stoic practice? Yeah, yeah you're right. There is, there is a lot of them. That's, that's yeah. why with uh, Greg, um, my friend and co-author that I mentioned earlier, we actually came up with a collection of like 52 different exercises. Yeah. Um, one for favorite... each, right? So in that's your right. book, it was one for each week. Yeah. That's right. Well, you can do one for a week for an entire year if you want to. Mm-hmm. My favorite practice, I guess, is the uh, dichotomy of control, or some, what's mm. sometimes called the dichotomy of control. So this is a notion that it's fam- famous, famously in Epictetus, although it actually goes back to early Stoicism. And this is the notion that some things are under our control and other things are not under our control. And that a good life is one in which you focus on what is your, under your control, because that's where you can act. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then develop an attitude of acceptance or equanimity toward the things you don't control because you don't control them. And therefore, there's nothing you can do about it I mean, anyway. And the way you do the exercise is, let's say that you are facing a situation that is potentially problematic or difficult. Let's say, I don't know, a job interview, for instance, mm-hmm. right? Then what you do, the way you do the exercise is before facing the situation, in one, one, in order to prepare yourself, you, you sit down and you make two lists. You can do it mentally, or you can do it on paper, or you can do it where you're, you know, on your laptop. But you do two lists: you, uh, one of things that you control, and one of things you don't control about that particular situation. And you need to be as specific as possible. That is, make as many entries in those in that table as possible. For instance, you can say, "Well, under my control is to prepare for interview, to write the best resume that I can, to try to show up." Uh, in time for the interview, to dress appropriately for the interview, not to go out drinking with my friends the night before the interview, because that otherwise gets in the way of my performance. All of those things are under my control, right? What is not under my control? Well, the outcome of the interview, whether I get the job or not, that's not up to me. The competition for the interview, that's not up to me. 
whether I actually show up on time because I might have the intention of showing up in time, but then there is traffic or the subway doesn't work or whatever it is. So showing up in time might not be uh, actually under my control. Um, and uh, the impression that my resume makes on the interviewer, that's not under my control, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, right? So what's the point of all of this? Well, because once you see those, those two lists, you know, either see them mentally or better, you write them down. It helps you focus on the aspect of that list that are under your control. And it also uh, helps you develop this attitude of acceptance for the things that are not under your control. And that notion of the dichotomy of control is really life-changing. And mm -hmm. that is one why I think it's found not just in Stoicism, it also pops up in uh, 8th century Buddhism, in 11th century Judaism, and even in 20th century Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly some of your uh, listeners have heard of the Christian, the, the Christian serenity prayer. Mm -hmm. Serenity prayer is something that is said usually at the beginning of meetings of 12-step uh, organizations like Alcoholic mm -hmm. Anonymous, right? But it's actually use, use for, useful for everybody. And the serenity prayer asks God to give us the wisdom to tell the difference between what we can change and what we cannot change, yeah. the courage to change what we can, and the serenity to accept what we cannot. Well, that's exactly the dichotomy of control, right? Mm -hmm. It's the wisdom of telling the difference between what you control and you don't control, mm -hmm. uh, the courage to focus on what you do control, mm -hmm. and then the serenity, the equanimity uh, toward what you do not control. Mm -hmm. So that's my favorite exercise, and I've done it plenty of times either uh, on the fly, mentally, uh, when, mm -hmm. if there's a situation that develops in the, in the moment, uh, or if I have more time, actually, as an exercise, you know, written down, uh, mm -hmm. you know, s sitting down and writing the, the, two, the two components of whatever mm -hmm. it is that I'm facing. Yeah, also, I, I think it is helpful because when you see the, those you know, things that uh, you can control, which is according to Epictetus, only your you know, decisions and your actions and you know, what, what, whatever is your, your own doing, he says, right? And the other things that are, uh, the last word is not, it doesn't belong to you, right? The, the last word That's doesn't right. belong to you there, exactly. but the others, the last word belongs to you. And now when you see that, okay, as you said, for example, the impression my resume will make or my you know, interview will make on the uh, employer or the person who does the interview, I don't need to worry about it, right? right. The, uh, there, there's no point of being anxious. There's no point of feeling anxiety about it because exactly. that will change nothing. It's not in my control. But then if you look at the other side, right? The things that are in your control, again, feeling anxious, uh, having anxiety about them again it's just uh not reasonable because it is in your control so why right. so then looking at it and seeing that that kind of negative emotion or pathological emotion is just doesn't fit you know just That's right sense. now it's not easy of course not to be yeah. anxious even even if you do realize that some things are under your control and others are not it's not easy yeah. that's why you need to practice it right yeah on yeah. a regular, yeah. regular basis but this is also one of those stoic exercises that has strong empirical support from modern cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy because mm -hmm. that is the kind of exercise that cbt practitioners will have you do all the time mm -hmm. and little by little you develop these these uh, uh ability basically to in fact it, it's one of those exercises they do in order to reduce people's anxiety yeah yeah, yeah. What, what was so, something i always say when i talk about this to students is so for example you can ask a question like for example about uh, habit management right um i want to get up early in the mornings you can ask that or you can say how can i become a person who gets up early right, right. so the becoming the kind of person in time is the stoic approach exactly exactly that's right Okay. All right. We are out of time. Um, thank you very much for joining right. me. And thank you very much. All your uh, the, the, the opinions that, that you have talked about. I think it is it has been very beneficial for our uh, listeners. Uh, I hope in the future, maybe we can uh, do something like this again. Maybe we can focus on the practices, the actual right. practices. Um, okay. Uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me.